This Jewish family owns America. Most folks these days are under the impression that the American economy is shaped by the likes of Mark Zuckerberg and Elon Musk. But that's far from the truth. Since the 18th century, certain families of Ashkenazi Jewish descent have played an integral role in shaping the financial landscape. And what's interesting is that these dynasties managed to achieve greatness despite being immigrants and stand tall with unimaginable wealth even today. Welcome to Fortunepedia, where we explore the extraordinary. Today, we'll be talking about a Jewish family that owns America. Just who are these business tycoons that shaped America as we know it today? And more importantly, how did they do it? Let's find out. Chapter 1. Goldman Sachs Meet Marcus Goldman, a business pioneer who managed to turn not only his family's life around for generations to come, but also the country's. Born on December 9, 1821, Goldman had humble origins, with his father making a living as a simple farmer and cattle dealer. However, Goldman didn't shy away from hard work. Despite his unembellished background, he dreamed of reaching new heights. And it's this drive to achieve greatness that gave him the courage to move to America during the Revolution of 1848. However, achieving the American dream was an uphill climb for Marcus. He started off small as a peddler, pushing a horse-drawn cart on the streets. He eventually ended up boarding a room in Philadelphia, shared by his old pal Joseph Sachs. Little did these two men know that together they would make history. Fast forward to 1869, and Marcus stumbled on the bridge brilliant idea of making his mark in New York, the center of American finance. He founded Marcus Goldman and Company, where he worked as a broker focusing on IUS. During his first year, Goldman ended up buying and selling $5 million worth of IOUs and raked in around $250,000, which was a huge amount of money back in the day. The Goldmans were finally seeing better days as they relocated to an extravagant 90-foot-tall brownstone mansion at 649 Madison Avenue, which is known as the corner of 60th Street today, a stark contrast to their origins. It was clear that Marcus had a flair for this line of work since it didn't take him long to land clients. He eventually ended up raking in millions of dollars annually. Fast forward to 1882, Marcus ventured into new territory by inviting his son-in-law, Samuel Sachs, to join hands with him. And so, the company's name was changed to M. Goldman and Sachs. Together, these two families were able to make massive profits, handling tens of millions in transactions every year. The partnership remained a resounding success for nearly 50 years. At this point, it was time to give way to a new leadership. Did the new blood manage to rise to the challenge or fail? Before we tell you, make sure to leave a like and subscribe to our channel for more videos. Chapter 2 the second generation. In 1885, Marcus brought in his son Henry and son-in-law Ludwig Dreyfus as junior partners, while the company took on a new name, Goldman Sachs and Company. As luck would have it, even under a new name, the firm continued to break barriers. A significant turning point came in 1896, when Goldman Sachs secured their membership in the New York Stock Exchange. Shortly after, Marcus left the game, leaving the company in the hands of his son, Henry Goldman and son-in-law Samuel Sachs in 1904, who carried on the legacy. In fact, thanks to his innovative thinking, Henry was able to take the firm to new heights. He ventured forth into the territory of industrial financing. And what do you know? The bet paid off, with the firm landing the offerings of major players like Sears Roebuck and F.W. Woolworth. Chapter 3 – The Third Generation The streak of good fortune continued even with the third generation sitting at the helm. And so, two men with humble beginnings were able to etch their names into the annals of American history. As immigrants, Goldman and Sachs managed to exceed all expectations by being the first to float the idea of using commercial paper as a financing tool for entrepreneurs. By 1968, the company had underwritten $100 million worth of short-term financing for the Penn Central Corporation, one of its biggest companies in the States. This was a historical milestone because, for years, Penn Central had given the Jewish company a cold shoulder, preferring their American counterparts. But in the end, Goldman Sachs persevered. 
They were even able to make waves on the international stage by joining the New York Stock Exchange in 1896. And then in 1999, the company finally went public and everyone wanted in. The Jewish firm ended up hiring top bankers in the business and building up its private equity business. The 20th century was marked by the leading electronic investment research distribution and introduction of innovative financial products. The company was even able to weather the financial crisis in 2008. While rival firms suffered unimaginable losses, Goldman and Sachs bet it right by predicting trouble in the mortgage market and making a huge proprietary bet about it collapsing. The result? A whopping 4 billion trading profit in 2007. At the end of the day, the story of Goldman Sachs is one of resilience and brilliant innovation. Their success inspires others in their shoes to take the leaps and pursue their dreams. That said, the road to the top did not come without its obstacles. For example, a short time after securing its deal with Penn Central, the company filed for bankruptcy in June 1970, one of the largest on American soil. Investors were pissed and took the firm to court as they suspected the partners of selling commercial paper even after receiving information about the financial condition of the company. The lawsuits threatened to bleed the company's capital dry. Fortunately, Goldman Sachs was able to settle the dispute outside the court with pennies on the dollar. More recently, in 2018, the company found itself battling a scandal involving a corrupt Malaysian sovereign wealth fund and a group of two or three of its bankers in Asia. The scandal ended up tarnishing the company's reputation and drove down market capitalization by 20% in the month of November 2018. Chapter 4. The Goldman Sachs Today However, with a dash of luck and some ingenious thinking, the company continues to stand tall even today. They've since then diversified their portfolio by offering personal loans, breaking into the tech field by advising big companies like Microsoft, and acquiring properties like the Rockefeller Center. As of April 19th, 2024, the group has a mind-blowing net worth of $131.11 billion, with over 45,300 employees. However, don't be fooled. Goldman Sachs isn't merely a group of power-hungry individuals looking to fill their pockets. Over the years, the company has made sure to give back to the community. They have made big donations to educational institutions for the development of infrastructure and for funding scholarships, thereby changing the lives of hundreds of students. Health and medicine remain an area of interest as well, with the company making significant contributions to setting up medical centers and funding cutting-edge research. Their generous contributions have also allowed cultural institutions and museums to flourish. And so Goldman Sachs has managed to leave behind an indelible mark in history, with a legacy that transcends the barriers of time, not merely as business pioneers, but as deeply invested individuals who care about their community. While this Jewish family owns America, Europe is a different story. Beyond the borders of the states, the playing field is worked by 10 families from the shadows, possessing immense power and wealth. Just who are these dynasties pulling the strings? And how did they attain this position of great influence? Click on the screen right now to find out about the 10 richest families who secretly own Europe.